It was the early evening for Kazuma as he arrived to the Kanagi compound, more fashionably late than anything else. The reason for the dinner was to celebrate the new arrangement that had been made. For one, Kazuma had not returned to the family. No, that was never going to happen. This was nothing more but a partnership. Kazuma was a man that sold his skills to the highest bidder. And, fortunately or unfortunately in this case, he came from a family that had deep pockets. The type of family that had old money. The kind of money that you just make a phone call and you could get what you want. Your name carried a lot of weight. That's why it was a big deal for Cosmo to be here. Someone that achieved the level of success that he did all without using the Kanagi name. It was more impressive than anything else. If not for the circumstances that he came from, the circumstance of being an exiled Kanagi, he would be a man of high regard and high respect. Not that he wasn't already, but there was always going to be the underlying tension of knowing that he was an exiled Kanagi, the prodigal son, if you will, that finally returned home, but returned home with his own monicum of success. And being an ice magic user, that definitely counted for a lot. Of course, Ayano was more annoyed than anything else as Kazuma finally arrived. She thought he wasn't going to show up at all. He took his seat and would be waited on as he ate his food with the others. There were some who had mixed feelings about it all. Of course, Kazuma had been believed to be the Kanagi family killer, but seeing as how he wasn't, they couldn't hold anything against him. There were some who were genuinely happy to see that he was back, and others who even had a hint of jealousy. They had written him off to be nothing, and now he came back as a conquering hero. And not just any hero, but a hero in high demand. They had to swoop him up because, sure enough, if they didn't, potentially their enemies could. This was more so for their own safety than anything else. Technically speaking, Cosmo was a free agent who could go to any side. The Kanagi family, as powerful as they were, they had enemies. Enemies who would pay for their destruction. And unfortunately, Cosmo was in the mindset that if anyone paid him enough, there wasn't anything that he wouldn't do. Hell, if it came down to it, there weren't Kanagis that couldn't get bumped off either. And Kazuma knew this. That's why, in a way, he was happy to take the deal. Of course, he could still go and do his own thing, but now he just couldn't raise his hand against his old family. Which was fine with him. He didn't want to have any more of an interaction with them than he needed to. And he wasn't a fan of unnecessary bloodshed. Among the staff who were looking out for them, members who served the Kanagi family, one of them, Misao Kanagi. She looked to Kazuma, happy to help him in any way that he wanted, much to Ayano's annoyance. Of course, for Misao, she wanted to show her gratitude. After all, Kazuma had helped in thwarting the plans of the Fuga clan, who could have caused great harm to the Kanagis, and she felt like her brother had been avenged through Kazuma. Although for Kazuma, he wouldn't take that type of praise, because after all, it was because of him that her brother died in the first place. Ayano was a bit surprised to hear Kazuma say that, but he had to admit the truth. It happened when Ayano had been traveling with the two of her cousins. One of them was Misao's brother, Takia. When they attacked Kazuma, he didn't kill them, of course, but he'd certainly left them rather beat up and made it a whole lot easier for Raiga to take them out. So in a way, he wasn't responsible for killing them, he just made it easier for someone else to do it. And for Misao, she knew that. Kazuma, he had no qualms with Misao's feelings. That's why he wasn't going to hold it against her. Since he already knew that she had that dagger 
under her sleeve. She would immediately pull out the blade as she attempted to stab him. Of course, it didn't work. The moment the blade made contact with him, it shattered, frozen over and broken to pieces. Ayano and the others would restrain her. And Kazuma, he wanted no part of this. He knew why she was angry. She had every reason to be. But he wasn't going to stand against her. That meant that Jugo and the others would have to take responsibility for her punishment. This was a reflection on their family. Regardless to how anyone felt, Kazuma was their guest. And not only that, he was personally being hired by the family. So anyone acting out of line against him, that was not going to fly. And Jugo made that very clear to anyone that had an issue with Kazuma. For Kazuma... He didn't really much care. Misa was free to do whatever she wanted. It's not like she could kill him anyway. Cosmo would take his leave for the evening, with the mood becoming rather awkward after. A few days later, Ayano would be walking home from school along with her friends. As they were leaving, they spotted Cosmo as he was walking through the streets with a woman, an older woman. Blonde, wearing a purple-like business suit. She was accompanying Kazuma arm in arm. Ayano wondering who she was. And why exactly was she so close to Kazuma? Why were they so, well, intimate in a way? This was Detective Kirika. Kirika Tachibana. Kirika served with a special task force, you might say. One that had been established a little over 20 years ago. But some say that its roots went much deeper than that. You see, this task force was a lot different. They weren't like your police or your regular detectives. Nothing of that nature, no. Technically speaking, they were a task force that didn't exist. But they looked into things. Things that most people don't normally look into. Whenever there was a strange occurrence or something that couldn't be explained, you don't call the police. You call people like her. Because she has connections. Connections to some powerful individuals. Individuals who had to look into certain cases of the bizarre, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the things that couldn't be explained. As Kirika and Kazuma walked arm in arm, he was getting a chance to catch up on everything that was going on in Japan since he'd been gone. So, what's on the to-do list, Detective? Kazuma would ask. Well, I would say it's actually a good thing that you're back. We've been swamped with work, and... If you ever want to look into a case or two, be my guess. How much could you have? Where do I start? Earlier this summer, there was the spotting of a werewolf. A werewolf? Up in the mountainside, we can't confirm if it's a werewolf, a grizzly bear, a fox, or something along those lines. But you know we can never be too careful. Then, there's been talks of vigilanteism... Some man dressed in all white. They say that he's kind of deranged, going on and on about evil spirits and such. Then we're looking into the Mishima Zaibatsu. What, the people that run the King of the Iron Fist tournament? Yeah, word on the street is they have dealings a lot darker than just the criminal underground. It's said that they're trying to revive an old god. An old god, huh? Yes, and any god revival never turns out well, along with some other guy called the Daredevil, or the Devil Man, who knows? A Daredevil and a Devil Man. Wow, you guys sure know how to pick them. And may I ask, what's Satoru doing in all of this? Oh, Satoru? He's off frolicking like he normally does. 
he's actually taken on some students of his own. Among them, that special case from Brooklyn. That kid, Kazuma said. Mm Mm-hmm. The vessel child. Although, and tragically, he passed away. During an incident at a correctional facility, he died fighting against one of those spirits. That's unfortunate. Although, the higher-ups are probably happy about it. Given that he was potentially an S-class disaster just waiting to happen. Though I never expected Gojo to take on students. It's not something he does often. There is that Akotsu boy that he was training a year ago. But where it is, he's left to another continent altogether. In any case, we have a lot going on right now. As for regular stuff, there's just a lot of smuggling here and there. You know, trafficking drugs, guns, human, cattle. It's said to all be coming from this spot here in the South China Sea, a place called Rowanapur. I've actually been there. And what would you be doing in a godforsaken city like that? Hey, my work takes me all over the world. I never know where I'm going to end up. But you are right. The place is godforsaken. Even for someone like me. Took everything in my power not to freeze the whole place over and just watch it fall. But that'd only be doing more harm than good. And I tend not to mix my personal work with business. But I'll leave it to you, detective. I've actually got a date. Mmm. It's not like the famed Kazuma to be going out on a date. Trust me, I really don't want to, but I kind of have to. Well, try not to get yourself hurt too bad, pretty boy. I'm going to go visit Genma, my father. Oh, what? You're telling me you got a thing for that crotchety old man? He's got his charm. And I see that it didn't fall too far from the tree. You're both pretty similar in a way. Oh, please. I'm nothing like that old fool. Don't ever compare me to him. <laughs> okay, then. Take care, Kazuma. In the meantime, Ayano, who had now dragged Ren into her little stalking affair, had been following Kazuma all over town, even to the more lecherous parts. Because Kazuma was not alone. No, he had someone with him. And it was Misao. Of course, for Ren, he had an idea of where this was going, and he felt like he was not age-appropriate to be in this situation. For Ayano, she had similar suspicion, but that only made her angrier. Because if Kazuma was doing what she thought he was doing, and with poor Misao of all people... Well, safe to say, she was about to blow a gasket. As they continued following after the both of them, they went further and further into a much more sketchier part of town. A place where there was a run-down love hotel. Not the classiest place in the world, but when you're trying to save money and you're just trying to get it in, it'll work in a pinch. But for Cosma, he had the sneaking suspicion that they weren't going to be knocking boots. No, instead, they were going to be knocking bullets. Immediately, Misa would move out of the way as an armed group of men would arrive, all of them shooting at Cosma from every direction. From a distance, for Ayano and Ren, it looked like Cosma was getting lit up by machine gun fire. And then for good measure, a few grenades were thrown in as well. The storm clouds were starting to form above them. The thunder colliding. For Misao, she believed that her plan had worked perfectly. However, when the gun smoke finally cleared, she came to learn how sadly mistaken she truly was. Because Kazuma stood back up like nothing had happened. Even for Ayano and Ren as they showed up and made their presence known, she made it clear that that level of firepower wasn't going to be enough to kill Kazuma. And she should know, she's actually tried with something way stronger. 
And Kazuma would echo those sentiments. I gotta say, it's not like it was a bad idea. If I had been anyone else, you probably would have taken my life. Or at least I had a decent chance at it. Unfortunately, I'm just one of those few that this isn't gonna cut it. It's not like I'm out of options, Miso would say. Getting ready to call in for the sniper to fire. Only for him to have been taken out in the process as well. With all due respect, I saw that coming too. Miso, Ren would say. Why are you doing this? Because, because of him. My brother is gone. He was the only one that cared about me. The only one that truly loved me. And you took him away. So now. Now I'll take you away. And why does it matter? No one will mourn you. Not your father or mother. No one. I'm right here. Ren would say. If you could love someone like him Ren. Then I question what type of heart you truly have. Okay okay that's enough. Ayano said. I don't like Cosma as much as anyone else, but even I recognize that there are rules, Misao. Cosma is an ally to the Kanagi family, and your actions, they bring shame upon our family name. There's no need to do all of that, Cosma would say. I'm the one she's after. There's no reason for you to go in on her, and like hell there is. She tried to make a move against an ally of the Kanagi family. That besmirches our family name. Don't you get that? I'm sorry, I don't get that. Because with all due respect, I'm not a part of the Kanagi family anymore. I'm nothing but an ally. I'm a tool, an asset. That's all. And besides, it's not like she has the strength to kill me anyway. In a fit of rage, Misa would attempt to attack him with her firepower. But the flames that emitted from her hand, they did nothing. Nothing at all. Like I said, she can't harm me. But does this make you feel better? Did you get it all out? I'll never, I'll never forgive you. I didn't ask if you forgived me. I asked if you got out of your system. Because this is all you can do. You're never going to be able to lay a scratch on me. But what about me? A booming voice would yell from above on top of the building. She can't give you the fight that you're looking for, Kazuma. But I can. Oh, what the? Cosmo rolled his eyes as he recognized that voice. But why the hell was he here? Ayano, Ren, Misao, get out of here. What? Brother, what? I said get out. <sighs> Long time no see. I told you we would meet again, Iceman. Namor said. As he jumped down to face Kazuma. Aren't you supposed to be somewhere in South America? What are you doing here? I came here on other family business. But word got out that you were back in town. I couldn't miss this opportunity. The opportunity to finally get my revenge. It seems like everyone wants revenge these days. Look. I really don't have time for this. Well, you better make time. Because otherwise, I might just have to do something to get your attention. Yeah, like what? How about I flood this entire country? Oh, don't be stupid, Cosmo would say. Trying to make an empty threat like that isn't going to get you anywhere. We both know that you wouldn't do something that would bring irreprehensible damage onto your family name. Unless you're really ready to squander it all, then by all means, be my guest. 
as calculated as ever. Look, I really don't want to do this. Well, unfortunately for you, I do. Namor would punch Cosma square in the face, knocking him through one hotel and out the other. Ayano, Ren, and Misao would begin running and steering clear of the fight as Cosma came out in his Iceman form. You know, I really don't like fighting when money's not on the line. But I'll make an exception for you. Let's go. The clash of ice, wind, and water spirits could be seen. Namor was not holding back anything as he fought against Kazuma, and Kazuma wasn't either. As he created a long trail of ice as he rode up into the sky as Namor was flying, the two of them having a battle in midair. Kazuma able to make a streak of ice and glide from one area to another, matching with the speed of Namor as he flew. They could see that there seemed to be like wings on his feet, he went at full throttle as he grabbed Cosma by the face and slammed him into the dirt. Cosma quickly responding with an ice-enhanced punch. The sounds of what appeared to be ice breaking, bone crackling, blood splattering. This was definitely a fight between two powerful spirit users. Ayano recognized Namor. After all, their families had met from time to time, but she hadn't seen him in almost 12 years. Namor hailed from the family of the Talak clan. The Talak clan, much like the Kanagi clan, were some of the most powerful of the spirit users. The Talak clan were known for their skills in water magic, for their Affinity came from the water spirits. And when you live on a planet that's 70% water, you can imagine how powerful you are, especially when you fight on the sea. But to see that one of their members was going at this much power to actually push Cosmo to this extent. For Ayano, she was wondering how they even knew each other and how this level of hatred could have even been fostered between them. By the time everything was all said and done, there were multiple pillars of ice strewn out all across the area, along with great flooding of water. That you could chalk up to the rain, but for the ice, well, that'd be a lot harder to explain. When it was all said and done, you could barely even call this a fight, more so of a slugfest than anything else. And as for a winner, well, that couldn't be determined either. This was more of a draw than anything. As the time that Cosma finally emerged, Namor wasn't too far away. Ugh. Oh, Cosma, Ren said. I'm good. <sighs> Are you done yet? I'm not done with you, Cosma. We'll see each other again. And I swear, I am going to kill you. Yeah, keep talking, fish breath. Oh, oh, this hurts. Damn it. You always seem to make everything like child's play, Ayano said. And you're saying that this is what takes the wind out of you? Hey. He's a cheeky little bastard. Ugh. Ayano and Ren would have to carry Cosma back to his hotel. As they finally got him into bed, Ayano and Ren would help treat his wounds. He wasn't too bad off. He just had the wind knocked out of him. This was one of those fights where they were just throwing haymakers to see what landed. And they had definitely taken some deep shots. How the hell do you know Namor? Ayano would ask. And how the hell did you become on his shit list? Well, in my line of work, you meet a lot of powerful people. Some friends, some foe. Unfortunately for him, 
its foe. What happened? The Talic clan? Ren would ask. Oh yeah, I guess you've never actually met them. They're called the Taliks. Kazuma would say. The Talik clan. They originate from South America. Off the coast. It was said that they descended from the Aztecs. They were a clan that made a deal with the water spirits. During the time of colonialism. When the Spanish started coming in with their conquests. The conquistadors drove them to the seas. They made a deal with the water spirit Talik and took her last name. With that, she allowed them the gift of using water magic. And from then, they made their home in the ocean. They formed a special temple with a barrier. You need to have a member of the clan or be a water magic user yourself just to be able to get to it. From there, they regrew and they got powerful. So much so that now in the modern day, they're able to rival even the Kanagi clan. But what's his story though? Oh, Namor? Well, you could say he's kind of like me, but in reverse. I was the guy that got kicked out of a royal family. He was the guy that had to be fought to get in. Fought to get in? Ayano would ask. You don't know the story? <clears throat> Shows how much you do your homework. Oh, shut up and just tell it. Ow! All right. Namor's father was a pirate. Not a bad pirate, but just a guy that traveled the seas and went wherever the wind took him. It was said that he was a wind magic user. So one day, his ship wrecks and he's left at sea. Well, who should save him but the daughter of the Talik clan's leader? They fell in love. But unfortunately, her hand was promised to someone else in marriage. The only way it could be annulled was if her newly beloved could win in a battle against her former fiancé. And he won. From there, she was allowed to marry him, and it was seen as more of a benefit than anything else to have a wind magic user brought into their clan and to marry to the heiress. Of course, because he was an outsider, he wouldn't be able to assume the throne, but his child would. And that child turned out to be Namor. Mm-hmm. He's not like many contractors in the world. He's one of the very few that has the ability of using multiple. His father came from descendants that formed a contract with the spirit of the wind. His mother, a people that formed a spirit with the water. And because of that, he has access to both. So you can tell why he's powerful. You can gather wind spirits pretty fast and water just as fast. And that makes him dangerous. Okay, so why does he hate you? <laughs> well, you see, I was in the United States a couple years ago, in Miami to be specific. I was doing a job, and that job led me to getting involved with Namor. We were both trying to get our hands on something, and I got it first. And I kicked his ass and a lot of his subordinates' ass in the process, and they took it as a sign of disrespect. I feel like there's more to it than that. I may or may not have been shacking up with the girl he was shacking up with. Cosmo, you didn't, Ren would say. Look, with all due respect, it was a one-time thing. I was drunk out of my mind and she was wearing... Oh, God, she was so fine and... Ow, ow, ow! I don't think we need to hear any more of this, Ayana would say. So, you stole his girl. You jacked him on a mission. Yeah, I can understand why he'd hate you, too. Look, he's just bitter about the past. He really needs to get over it. 
He's supposed to be the future leader of the Talek clan anyway, so I don't know why he's wasting his time on me. I'm just a nobody. Well, yeah, you might be a nobody, but you're a nobody that everyone really wants to kill. He's not going to be able to kill me. He always goes on and on about how I'll flood this whole country if it means I can take your life. Da, 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 da. But he could never do something that extreme. You push someone hard enough, you don't know what they're capable of. That I can agree with. In the meantime, Misao found herself wandering the streets alone. It was true. She wasn't strong enough to get her revenge. As she found herself walking to the park, the rain pouring over her, she would be approached by two individuals, a boy she didn't know and one that looked vaguely familiar to her, a boy that was flicking a lighter on and off. Hey there, Misa. It's been a while. John? John is... No. No, it can't be. You're... You're supposed to be... Dead? Nah. I know some people might think that, but... I'm very much alive. But how... How could this be? I, we were at your funeral and there was no body. I know I was supposed to die, but fate had other plans. The other boy said, who are you? My name is Michael, Michael Harley. And I'm so pleased to meet you, you poor soul. I was content, John said. I was content on just staying away. I felt like I brought enough headache to the family, but when I heard about your brother, Misao, I couldn't help but get to you as soon as possible. I know that you're hurting right now. Cosma took him away from you. I just... I loved him so much. I know, Misa, I know. And it seems like no one in the family wants to help you. They're taking his side. The side of a murderer. The side of someone that betrayed you and me. What? Cosma has a tendency of leaving bodies behind. He doesn't care who he hurts in the process as long as he gets his money, right? Someone as selfish as that, someone like that doesn't deserve to live. But if they're not going to step in, then it's only right that you do what needs to be done. Don't you believe that? Michael said. What could be more righteous than taking up justice for those who have fallen. You seek justice for your brother. We can help you with that. You can? But we need your help, Miso. That other guy? It would be in our best interest if we took him out as well. After all, he comes from a rival clan to the Kanagis. Think about it, Miso. You can show the family the error of their ways. You can show them that you're not weak, John said. If you help us, not only will you avenge your brother, but you will weaken one of the mightiest clans in the world. And when they look to praise, they'll praise you. The Kanagi family will recognize your strength because you did what they couldn't do. What are you saying, Misa? Don't you want it? You want your revenge. John, Misa would say, 
I feel like this is a miracle. You were dead, but now you're back to life. In my time of need, I feel like you're my angel. I'll be whatever you need me to be, Misa. No matter what, all you have to do is trust me. I promise. I will be your angel of fire. And I promise you. Cosmo will burn in your righteous fury. For what could be more righteous than justice? This concludes Kaze no Stigma, Stigma of Winter. What if Kazuma was Iceman? Season 1, Part 3. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned tomorrow as we continue with Kaze no Stigma, Stigma of Winter. What if Kazuma was Iceman? Season 1, Part 4. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings, signing off, and I'll see you next time.